pleasure to uh, to be here again. And this is my third time <laughs> in terms of forums. So so far, 100% with the tick on the presence. Uh, it's always fantastic to meet uh, all the alumni that we have around the world, and particularly to be able to share, uh, in my case, uh, practical applications of what we do. Right. So we've heard outstanding engineering coupled with research opportunities to do startups and or coupled with the corporate world immersion after you do your degree, right? If we do some fast forwarding, what is it that we do with our technology out there in the field? At the end of the day, technology should serve a purpose for society to make a buck, right? To leave, we get a salary and so forth and so on. So the purpose of my presentation is to try to share with you based on my experience in General Electric, I work now for General Electric, oil and gas. I manage worldwide um, drones and artificial intelligence for methane uh, emissions, and I've had other hats. So my, my purpose today is just to briefly share with you IoT applied with artificial intelligence in two particular use cases, right? So again, from the origins of what we do to some practical applications. Now, what you're going to see is the state of the art, right? Is Barely new, product development inclusive, so partnering with clients. Um, and therefore, it may sound a bit basic, but believe me, it's still a state of the art. Ready to go? Launch. Launch. Why IoT? Why artificial intelligence? Or what artificial intelligence? Why is it relevant to us? What is IIoT? And the two cases. And why I'm saying this is because nomenclature is very important when we try to communicate, right? For some people, IoT is one thing. What is AI for other people? And Magnus and I here share a, a common ground on that, but you'll see us debating on this later on. So let's get on. Why IoT? Why is IoT important? IoT is things connected to sensors. Sensors read the thing, KPIs of the thing, or the environment. You get the data, you analyze the data next to the thing, or you send it to the cloud. So far, so good, right? But why is it important? Well, if you take all, <coughs> if you take all business equipment connected in the world, you get to 100 million devices. If you do that with home devices, people is a billion. If you take all the devices that we wear, particularly iPads, mobiles, etc., you get to 10 billion by 2020. It's an easy calculation. Seven billion people, percentage of those would have one device, two devices, three devices, serial devices. So 10 billion, right? So that's not a very impressive amount of devices connected, but if you connect all the things that we could connect by 2020, something that you can take electricity to and connect it to something else, you're talking to 50, 100 million devices worldwide. And that's just the beginning. The order of magnitude of the data wave of Internet of Things is going to blow away all this Google data that we get from our cell phones, right? This is the next data wave. In the future, just imagine how many things can be connected. So IoT, particularly for engineers in the industrial space, is of increased relevance. And I was very pleased to see at the Institute Lafayette the work we're doing with the censoring part of it. Because to get the data from the thing, you need the sensor, right? And I think we are in the verge of something important here. What is AI? I'm sure if we had an hour here and 50 people, we'll get 100 answers in three hours. W would you agree? Right? And I'll, leave, I'll let Magnus take us through that path. But this is one very simple definition that I've seen that I really, really like. AI is not one technology, it's many technologies. And when you hear we're doing AI, most likely we're doing deep learning, which is pattern recognition, to which if you add predictive analytics, you get machine learning. So at most, what we hear normally in industry is deep learning <coughs> with some predictive uh, analytics add up to machine learning. I'm gonna show you the machine learning part of AI. Fair enough? Why are those two relevant to us? Why should they be relevant to us? Well, certainly because there has to be an economic and a social impact, right? 
And it should be both, not just one. When we take a look at the path of the digital impact in our economy, what we are now here is in the insight economy because we are able to not only gather large amounts of data, thanks to digital, which is IT on steroids, that's what I also teach my students, digital is IT on steroids, meaning you basically have the cloud which allows you to process large quantities of data accessibly and affordably. You have the platform, which is the analytics way to gather that data and do something with it. And then you have analytics, which is the algorithms that let you run it. Once you have that capability to process that large amount of data to extract value, then associated to things, you're starting to get an inside economy. And the word here is insight. So data is oil, right? You've heard that? Yeah. I'm not very impressed with that comment, to be quite honest with you. It's a good analogy, it's a good buzzword, but data in itself is cost. Particularly when only, what, 30% is curated, 20% is connected, 5% is real time, right? Let's see what you do with that. What you do is you take data, you convert it into information, you convert that into knowledge, you take insight out of that knowledge, you take actionable insight, and then that insight becomes adoptable. That's what you want to do. You're going to get from the data to adopting insights. And therefore, that's the insight economy. And IoT is very well positioned to achieve that. But most importantly, it is not just about what technology can do today. It's about how it's affecting us, right? And this, you're going to see that now in the, in the examples. The key word here is what? So you have different technologies, and they, you have different technologies, right? And these technologies couple each other, overtake one the other. But what we're seeing is three of those being foundational, IoT, AI, and blockchain. Fair enough? So those two combined are very powerful, and it's not because they foster change. Change is a constant, you know that? It's because they accelerate change. So every time you hear somebody saying, I have a change plan, it sounds boring to me. Because the reality is that what we need to have is a plan to accelerate change. And those technologies are just doing that for us. So that's what's relevant for us as, uh, as business, people, society at large. Um, therefore, what is IIoT? Well, this is a term created by General Electric. That's where I work. IIoT is the industrial things plus analytics. So you take an industry, meaning oil and gas, that's where I work, chemical industry, automotive, you know, huge field of tubes, cables, machines of all kinds, right? And then you start connecting sensors to get data from it, not just the reliability of the thing, but how is the thing behaving? And then you start getting digital on industry, industrial digital, if you want to call it as well. It is really the convergence of IT and OT. So we, PLCs have existed forever, right? You've done your, a lot of work at engineering with PLCs. So it's not that digital didn't exist at the industry floor. It's that we've taken that data, the OT part of it, and connected via routers, cloud, platforms, analytics to an environment that we can extract value from it. So we've converged the IT on steroids digital with the operational technology, which is the data that you're extracting from the machine at that moment. It's that convergence that is IIoT. And that is the new digital space. It has to do with the productivity of things, which is mostly what we do as engineers, isn't it? We optimize, we bring farther productivity. Some eureka moments, grant, granted, but most of the time that's what we work on, optimize things. So, for all of you that probably already engaged in doing these things, that's, you know, IBM is, it's a clear leader in this. This is the space we're working on. So let's discuss one case. Now, it sounds maybe boring to some of you, but predictive maintenance is very important for the business. What is it trying to do? It's trying to get away from you need to change the compressor in two months to you need to change the compressor when you need to change the compressor. It's a huge difference, right? Because the vendor will tell you every two months you change the compressor. So what do you do? God forbid I'm not in guarantee terms, right? So you change it. 
How about if we put sensors to the compressor and we prove that it should be changed a month and a half after being bought or five months later? How about if we change it when we have to change it? That's a, that's a, that's a paradigm shift for the industry. Vendors don't like it because most of the time, we've already done this, have multiplied by three the length of the life of an injector, for example, for a plant in Catania to produce uh, wafers, uh, semiconductors, right? Chips for your cell phones. Uh, they have to come to terms with reality. The data is suggesting to vendors that maintenance can be done differently. Better for all of us. I'm saving money, which I'm translated to my consumers. I'm not wasting material. Three times less is going to the environment, right? And by the way, and this is the trick, no one is making the decision for me on when to change it. I decide the KPI as to when I want to change it. So the alert will come, change it when I decide. It is my risk in deciding those KPIs, but I decide it. Fair enough? So let's take a look at this. What is it? Now, ESPs, anyone has ever worked with an ESP? Anyone in oil and gas? You. Is it? Okay, Is, isn't that a critical part of oil and gas or not? Piece of equipment. Absolutely, Absolutely right? And you don't know when it's going to fail. So it's Thank you. We did not prepare these guys, right? Yeah, no. we ju I just met these men. <laughs> so an ESP is an electrical submersible pump, a very sophisticated piece of equipment that, for MEs, uh, if this is glory, just basically does very difficult things in very difficult conditions, extracting all kinds of fluids from under terrains that are in dire situations, you know, all kinds of densities, gases, water, crude oil, that's what we want, right? Pumps it up to a platform and then it's processed. So far so good. Sometimes it's not just a, you know, straight down piece of equipment as you see, sometimes it has to take angles and you know what happens when you have angles, right? Things get complicated. Where do we use these things? Just imagine a platform 150 kilometers offshore platform off the coast in the Arctic Sea. It gets cold there once in a while, right? Now, that platform, some of them are floating, some of them are not. When it's very deep, they are floating. That platform basically shoots down some piping where you have at the very end the ESP, which is subsea underground extracting the oil, the crude oil and what have you, right? Now, just imagine that the ESP breaks down. Again, 150 kilometers off coast, in the middle of winter, about 10 kilometers down, the thing breaks down. Wouldn't you want to know when it breaks down, before it breaks down? Wouldn't that make a difference? Because you shut down the offshore plant, you have to call a crew, you have to order the piece, unless, of course, you have many pieces around, ESPs, which is a lot of invent inventory cost. You agree, right? So the whole equation, the total cost of ownership of an ESP offshore platform to make it, you know, more profitable if you wish, safer if you, w if you wish, because hey, if I know a, a storm is coming and I know this thing is going to fail in 20 days and I have other maintenance to do, how about if I do it now? It's less risky, unconsolidated maintenance. So the whole equation is very simple, isn't it? So meet and now uh, meet what we call uh, asset management. So when you start doing asset performance management, what you do is attach sensors to the thing according to KPIs to start understanding when this asset is going to fail. This, is been, this is software, it's been going on for a long time. The outcomes are clear, right? Less, uh, less reactive management reduction, risks, inventory costs, TCO, availability increase, and employees are happier and work better, right? Uh, what it's really about is that you're creating actionable business insights. I know what the impact of the business is if this ESP is going to fall, it's going to fail, therefore I take action before it does because I have predicted it properly and I can plan for it, right? Do you remember the data, actionable insight? That's what we're trying to do here. I'm gonna show you one slide of a real dashboard that then I'm going to play to you in a video. Unfortunately, uh, our equipment is not Steve Jobs friendly. So the video I will show you in my little screen. 
and I'm gonna ask you to gather around me a bit, if you don't mind, to see what happens, and that would be a fun thing to do. We stand up a bit too, right? Nothing wrong with that. Uh, so what you're gonna see is a dashboard that reads the following. So this is the remaining useful life. Here is a calculation of the life of, in this case, the ESP. Here is a log of when you detect anomalies. Anomalies are anomalies. It doesn't mean that it's a terrible thing to happen. It's just something is happening. Something is happening because you have sent, well, you have set up actually KPIs that determine a range of good or not good. That's all. So the anomaly needs to be understood. Here is, oops, sorry about that. Here is the reliability of all the KPIs that you have decided to have. So you, des you decide what KPIs you want to follow, pressure, temperature, rotation, right? Grinding, vibration, whatever. Here you have all of those versus risk. But that's not the fun part. That's not the fun part. The fun part is this one. This is a graph that tells you the percentage survival in 30 days of that piece of equipment. You could say 20 days. You could say 50 days is your criteria as to when you want to expose your risk in terms of having a shutdown, right? So this is a percentage survival in 30 days. That is that the machine is going to be in an uptime for the next 30 days. If you decide that it's 70%, 30%, it's your call. It's your decision. But at least you know that the data will tell you when it will shut down. Now, you want to gather around a bit? Uh, show you the video. Yay. So I can stand up, right? There's nothing wrong with that, right? Yeah. All right. So uh, what you're going to see is that typically, if the pressure goes down, it impacts temperature, it impacts whatever, right? So once you have some of those KPIs collapsing against each other, the thing will probably fail, right? So take a look at here, and you're going to see, it just takes 30 seconds, right? Anomalies start happening like this. No, you want me to hold it? No, no, it's OK. Thank you. Anomalies are occur occurring, right? Look what is going to the curve, what is going on with the curve. Now what happens when you have too much risk versus KPIs? Collapses. You see that? You want me to play it again? For those of you who couldn't see it, I will not talk. <laughs> Take a look at there. Oh, it feels like I'm holding the holy right there. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me when it finishes, but it's not yet. There she goes. You got it? Yeah. I can predict, everyone loves it. I can get my management to move on and do the proper planning, and things work better, right? Another good thing about this is that if I include additional AI, I'm not really interested in what's happening to the ESP. I'm interested in what's happening to the transformer that runs the ESP, the pipeline that is uh, attached to the ESP, because if one thing breaks, the other one breaks, and so forth and so on, right? The adjacent equipment. So you start doing analysis, which is called N minus four, which is don't look at a compressor ESP, look at the whole offshore platform. And let's do some AI analysis on how does one thing affect the other, because maybe it shut down, not because the ESP had an issue, but because the power outage Right? Screw up the transformer. That's one of the values. Let's go quickly through the second case, methane emission management. Yeah, yeah, I'm very quick. So $30 billion in cost per year to the industry. It contaminates 80 times more than CO2. Isn't that something we should do to fix? So there are equipment out there, drone-based, solar-powered, that basically go around in a scheduled path on top of a well pad. You'll see a well pad in a minute. Finding via cameras where you have the fugitive, doing heat mapping to understand the origin of the fugitive. It's not good enough to localize it. It's not good enough to find the concentration, parts per million per meter, and neither the leak rate, how many kilos or pounds per, per hour. We also want to find what is the origin, so we stop it, right? And that's what this technology does using above all emission rate qualification. I'm rushing up a little bit. Uh, 
This is a typical uh, gas well pad. So what you have is the drone flying around in a pre-scheduled uh, observation path. And then eventually with all the data, you have a dashboard that tells you, hey, you have emissions here. You see the red one? That are above what you decided is not appropriate. A typical project will give you a bunch of data telling you which well pads are giving you how much concentration that you decide is appropriate or not. And then in this case, we can see a video. So this is, uh, I'm going to ask you to take a look here, right? So this is a drone that is flying. It detects via that technology a plume. And then it stops autonomously, zooms in, gets the data. You don't see the data here. You see it in the dashboard. And then goes to the next, right? It goes very quickly. Um, see the donors found it? Look at you. Do you see here? Do you see a shadow? Did you see a shadow? Do you see it there? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that plus GPS coordinates and the data tells the maintenance crew go to longitude, latitude, you know, whatever, and you go and fix it and get out. Versus having people running around getting toxic. That was all for me. Hopefully it was fast enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oscar. That was cool.